in our cultural imagination about the revolution, we have this idea that there has to have been something democratic and republican about it. Uh, that it's a kind of republican and democratic revolt against the ancien regime and monarchical power. Uh, and that is so powerful in our historical imagination. Uh, but these people, that is not all of them, but a great many of them, and certainly a great many of the most important ones, took themselves uh, to be waging a rebellion in favor of royal power. Uh, that is, they wanted more monarchy rather than less. And their view was that parliament was illicitly usurping uh, the just prerogatives of the crown. And that was their complaint. They took themselves to be waging a, a rebellion against a tyrannical legislature. By the time you get to the declaration in, in July of 76, uh, first of all, uh, a number of things have changed uh, on the ground. Word arrives in British America of the text of the king's speech in which he declares the colonies to be in rebellion, removes them from the royal protection, and at this moment there is a kind of trauma. So many British Americans uh, were putting all of their faith in the king uh, and looking to him to sort of revivify the English Constitution, defend their liberties, and in a sense uh, one of the ironies of the Declaration, since it's so often taken as this great statement of American anti-monarchism at this point, is that in a way it's the final uh, and most eloquent testimony uh, to the power of this sort of neo-Stuart theory of the empire. The word parliament doesn't appear in the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration uh, focuses on the king because in the constitutional and sort of juridical imagination of the patriots uh, at this period, uh, it's only the king who wields a legitimate authority over America. Once the debate is over, that is, once independence comes, the very same people who uh, get into print most prominently in the 1770s defending this uh, heavily royalist conception of the British monarchy uh, and the imperial constitution and the royal prerogative uh, don't change their minds. And exactly this same cast of characters are defending sweeping executive power uh, and become the chief advocates for the new constitution and its chief architects uh, in the 1780s. And they themselves uh, highlighted the continuity in their thought. They're going to create a monarch of a kind who is not a king, but who is given more prerogative power than any English monarch had wielded since the defeat of the royalist cause. We tend to think uh, of the presidency as sort of monarchy light. But in the context of the 18th century, as people understood perfectly well at the time, it was the reverse. It was monarchy plus. Uh, that is, it was taking uh, all of these prerogative powers that no English monarch uh, had wielded for generations uh, and locating them, uh, assigning them uh, to this new uh, chief magistrate.